Welcome to the Money is Emotional podcast with Christine Lukin, the Financial Dignity Coach. In this podcast, we help you recover a positive and peaceful relationship with your personal finances. We do this by bringing together wise money management with emotional intelligence. Join us for this journey where we navigate our relationship with money as Christine Lucan draws from years of experience and guest experts to help you get to the root of your money issues. Hello, and welcome to the Money is an Emotional podcast with your host, Christine Lucan. Christine, I really enjoy being with you every time we get together, so it's good to see you again. Good to see you, too. I feel like I have a caveat, though, on that. It's good to be with you again kind of thing, because I've looked at this topic. <laughs> I think What's wrong with I, it? <laughs> I think we're going to like I, I think we're going to define the uh, ultimate money is an emotional concept. It's managing money as a couple. Oh, Christine. Yes. Well, you know, we are not afraid to tackle the tough topics here. No, I know you're not. No, emotional. to your credit and, you know, my discomfort. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I, I delight in making other people uncomfortable. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, yes, absolutely. I mean, money can be a, a huge source of contention uh, in a relationship, but it doesn't have to be. Um, it actually can be an area of opportunity for increased communication and increased intimacy for a couple if they get on the same page with money. So it's a today big we're if though. I'm sorry, that is a big <laughs> if. It really is. It is. So I'm gonna it I'm gonna possible. go with you on this one. Okay. <laughs> I guess you're gonna be my devil's advocate. Is that what okay. you're saying? <laughs> so today we're actually gonna talk about some mindset shifts and practical actions that you can take to manage money better if you are part of a couple's relationship. Okay. So I think the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that each partner comes to the relationship with their own unique money blueprint. So we talked about the money blueprint in depth in episode two, why money is so emotional. Mm -hmm. And I learned this concept from... T. Harvecker in his book, Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. And so what is a money blueprint? Essentially, it's everything that you think about money, both consciously and unconsciously. So, you know, when we were born, we had zero opinions about money. Right. And we began to build this blueprint as we learned things from our parents, as we learned things from other influential adults in our lives. So, you know, the things that our parents said about money and more importantly, the, the behaviors that we witnessed of our parents, right? Because that's where we learn a lot of our early behaviors. Yeah. But it also includes all of our own emotional money encounters throughout the years, right? Because, you know, when my husband and I got married, I had 30 years of emotional money baggage down in my blueprint, right? right. And he had 33 years of his own experiences and thoughts with money. And then, you know, it's like you come together and if you think about like building a house, mm -hmm. we're building a financial house together. If I have one blueprint, if my partner has a completely different blueprint, yeah. when we come together, it's going to kind of look like a pretzel. Yeah, it's not going <laughs> to exactly look like maybe even a house. <laughs> right. So just understanding the fact that you're not going to have the exact same blueprint as your spouse right. or partner when it comes to managing money. 
and approaching it from that perspective, that's really the first thing that we need to keep in mind. And so I really encourage my clients to get curious, first of all, about their own money blueprint and about their partner's money okay. blueprint. And so one of the best questions that you can ask your partner is, how did your parents handle money when you were growing up? And then you can ask them, like, do you agree with that approach or not? That's, um, it's funny because you, when you were talking earlier, I was thinking about growing up and I don't remember my parents ever talking about money, you know, and, and so that like my blueprint would be off of behavior probably right. more than anything else. Yes. Yeah. And for a lot of us who, especially Gen Xers and older, many of our parents didn't explicitly teach us about money. Right. Right. We talked about that before we came on the air. It's like they didn't talk about sex and they didn't talk about money. Mm -mm. <laughs> they like, gave me a checkbook when I was a little kid. They gave me a checkbook and they, they made sure I knew how to subtract. That's that's about it. Well, well, that's good because that's more than some people get. <laughs> that's sad. Okay. I know. I know. But when you think about different experiences that you might have had, you know, let's just say as a little kid, you, you know, you were supposed to go to the store and get something for your parents, but you, you lost the money right on the way to the store. And okay. then you got yelled at, right? And then all of a sudden you have this emotional experience around money or, you know, I've had clients who I had one client whose uh, older stepbrother stole money out of her piggy bank Ooh. as a little kid, right? Like her parents figured it out and, you know, the money was given back to her, right? but she never put money back in that piggy bank again because she felt like it wasn't safe <laughs> to save that money. And so she spent it. And that like set up this pattern for her where when I had asked her to go and open a savings account, she literally had like a panic attack and couldn't go do it. Wow. And we finally uncovered because I asked her, I said, was there ever a time when it wasn't safe for you to save money? And then she was like, oh, and then she's like, well, that can't be it because I was five years old and that was only ten dollars. And I'm like. $10 to a five-year-old is like a million dollars, right? And so just like uncovering that blueprint and starting to examine, you know, what were some of the things that happened to you around money as a kid that left some kind of impression, either positive or negative, right? Because that's actually what creates those strong memories is the strong emotions, so if you had a strong emotional experience around money, either good or bad, then that's really going to become anchored in. So I find that it's really interesting because some people will do exactly like their parents did. Mm -hmm. And some people will do exactly the opposite. Ah. Right. So they'll be like, oh, this is the way money works, where they'll say, I hate the way you do this. I'm going to do the exact opposite and be be the rebel. So it's interesting to have those sorts of conversations and you can have these conversations early on in your relationship. You know, you don't have to be engaged or or be married to have right. that sort of discussion because it's, you know, you're not actually asking them, hey, what's what's exactly going on with your money right now? Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but it is kind of interesting to say, well, how did your parents handle money, especially if you start with sharing a story that left an impression for you? in childhood. But the next point I want to make is if you are married or in a committed relationship, yeah. you need to get financially naked with each other. Because most people have zero problem getting physically naked with their significant other. But I think uh, the study that I read recently I want to say it was between 30 to 40% of people had some sort of financial secret that they were keeping from their partner. That probably is low, I would guess. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. I'm not, not even being funny. It's probably yeah. low. Yeah. 
Right. So, you know, so how do you do that? I mean, I, I mean, I mean, look, I'm not going to be cute. I'm that's that uh, this does cut to the heart of money is emotional. Yeah. So how do you do that? I mean, you know, it's, it's like, I understand I understand what you're saying. I get the wisdom of what you're saying, but how mm-hmm. does somebody do that? Yeah. Well, I mean, here's the thing. You know, you you are basically in a business partnership with your spouse. If you're legally married, yeah. The two of you are considered one financially. You know, like if you get divorced, you know, unless you've got some sort of prenuptial agreement, it it's basically like you and your spouse are running the business of your household and your partners. And we we couldn't imagine running a business with a partner and lying to them about the financials, right? right. Like that's grounds for dissolving the business and the exactly. partnership. Yeah. So we need to think of it in that way is, you know, what I do affects you and vice versa. Now we're going to talk in a little bit about the logistics of, you know, can you have some separate money, et cetera, but separate money doesn't mean secret money. Mm -hmm. And if you're engaged or married, there shouldn't be any financial secrets between you because what you do directly impacts the other person. Oh, I understand that. Yeah. So it's really about getting to the heart of why you feel you need to keep some sort of secret. It's typically a trust issue. So, and and there's two types of secrets that people have a tendency to keep. One of them is, I don't want to tell you something bad that I have done Mm. (laughs) because I don't want to feel ashamed or judged by you. So I'm going to hide this mess from you and hope you don't find it or hope I can hurry up and clean it up before you find it. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So that that's one of the things that can happen. The, the other one that can happen is I am hiding money from you because I'm afraid you're going to do something bad with it. Mm. Right. Like I'm going to hide savings from you because if you know this money is here, you're going to spend it. I just won the lottery. I put the $3 million in a secret account so that we'll be fine. And, and you can't spend all of it. Right. Now, it's usually never that extreme, right? It's oh, usually I like I got a couple grand squirreled away over here in case of emergencies, but I'm not going to tell you about it because I don't want you to spend it. Yeah. And that's because I don't trust you to do the right thing. Now, when I was in my previous relationship with my ex-fiance, I used to do that. I used to, I wouldn't tell him when I had any extra money because he would find a way to weasel it out of me and spend it. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when an emergency, you know, when something came up and I did have an extra hundred dollars or whatever and I was able to take care of it, he would get mad at me that I was keeping secrets from him. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I thought that's an ugly catch 22. <laughs> and I'm like, well, wait a minute. Like I had the money to take care of this. Like, you know, aren't you going to be grateful? <laughs> yeah. But it really is that trust issue because I did not trust him. I did not trust my ex fiance. Sure. No. So clearly the ex fiance part is a good clue to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this means You know, if you've got one of these two scenarios, then there has to be a talk, right? Because otherwise, if and when the other person finds out, it's it's going to be a full blown fight. Yeah. Now, maybe there are some deeper issues that need to be handled and the arena where they're playing out is money. Good point. So a lot of times, you know, it's not necessarily about the money itself. There's some sort of deeper there, issue. Yeah, there now, are other issues going on. Yeah, sure. Right. Now, obviously, if your spouse or partner is hiding the fact that they're spending money on their girlfriend or boyfriend. Different <laughs> issue. Different issue. Okay. <laughs> 
whole different totally. conversation. Uh-huh. Yes. But, you know, money gets pulled in to these drama fests sometimes. And people will say it's about the money when it's actually not about the money. Right. So, all right. So the third point I want to make is if you are in a committed relationship, I want you to have a weekly money date. So, yes, you and your honey need to have a menage a trois with money. Mm. And you no, I'm sound so attractive. I, just... I do it again. <laughs> okay, I'm not talking about sex. You know what's interesting? Menage a trois actually means in French household of three. Mm. So, you your honey and money, you're all in a relationship together. Yeah. <laughs> when you get married. So I tell people, you know, pick one day a week, set aside 20 to 30 minutes. That's if you do this weekly, that that is all that you should need is 20 to 30 minutes and make it pleasant. You know, I tell people this doesn't have to be drudgery. You don't have to sit at a card table in the basement with a bear bulb hanging over your head. Yeah, right. <laughs> And it doesn't have to be, you know, you can pour yourself a glass of wine if you're doing it in the evening or, you know, your favorite tea or coffee, play some relaxing music and manage your money. You know, check on your spending, have a look at your accounts, pay the bills and talk about anything that the two of you need to talk about that's out of the ordinary. I feel like we make it so much harder than it needs to be. Yeah, we do. I, I you know, but I, I suspect uh, if you start having a date with your spouse and your money or your partner and your money, I, I, I suspect that like the initial meetings might be a little I, not rocky or uncomfortable or whatever, but I think, you know, it's like so many other things. The more you do it, the more comfortable you become with it. And then it becomes it becomes a second nature. It becomes a yes. second nature. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I had I had one couple who was really resisting doing the money date because you know, when I coach with people, we meet twice a month. Okay. And in between sessions, the two of them need to have their money date, right? So that they're either having their money date with me or they're having their money date, you know, just the two of them. But I'm starting to establish that weekly habit with them while we go through the coaching. And the wife said, well, I wish that this was as fun as our actual weekly date night. And I said, well, what about this? I said, what if you have the babysitter come over half an hour early And then you two go into the home office, do your weekly money date while you're all dressed up, do that first, and then go out to eat, and then have your actual date. And work that in. Yeah, it did. No, that's great. It did. And it was actually funny because I was was quoted in the Wall Street Journal for, for saying this next tip, but I have actually told people this. If you find it difficult to motivate yourselves to do the weekly money date, I said, you have my full permission to have your money date in your sexy clothes. Whoa. Or, or even naked if you promise not to touch each other until the money portion of the date <laughs> is over. <laughs> and that's what achieved you fame in the Wall Street Journal. Okay. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <clears throat> that's great what, I mean, whatever works <laughs> yeah no no that's interesting that's, well, that's uh, I, I'm sitting here shaking my head uh, and, and thinking wow this can give a whole new sort of opportunity as it were <laughs> there you go and then you'll have this positive association yeah exactly with the money so excuse me yes you. Thank you so much for listening to the Money is Emotional podcast. We hope you're enjoying it so far. 
If you have any questions or would like to talk more about this topic, you can find us at www.christinelukin.com and all of our social media platforms are listed in the show notes. Once you start to do your money dates, then it's it's time for you to you as a couple to decide what system works best for you to manage the money. So we're talking about the actual like the structures, the systems, the technology that you use. Okay. Now, obviously, when I am working one on one with my clients, this is something that I'm developing with them. So I have you know certain tools that I use. We talk about you know, which one of them feels more strongly about doing certain things. So, you know, there is, there's a couple pieces to this and there's no one size fits all, but there's the discussion of the accounts. Are we going to have all joint accounts? Are we going to have separate accounts or are we going to have a hybrid? So, Back in my parents' day, like, it was unheard of for separate accounts if you were married, right? right, right. Everything was joint. Um, You know, I think with Gen X, there's more of a hybrid approach. And I'm finding, like, with millennials and younger, a lot of them have separate accounts. And it's more of me, like, encouraging them to have some joint accounts. (laughs) Interesting. Right. So you've got this logistical piece of it. And it's like, okay, well, if we're having separate accounts, how do we create a system that's equitable for us to be able to pay the bills and handle the finances so that we're not constantly arguing over things? Right. Um, You know, I find that a lot of my clients really like the hybrid approach where. You know, the vast majority of the money goes into a joint account where all the bills are paid. Um, You know, the savings accounts are funded out of that, et cetera. But then each of them has their own separate spending account. So they have their fun money in their own account. And they don't necessarily owe their spouse or partner an explanation. Now, not that it is secret, but... Like we've decided on the amounts, you know, like, hey, you can have 500 bucks in fun money and I can have 500 bucks in fun money. And I don't care what you spend it on. I don't care if you get fake eyelashes. I don't care if, you know, you buy new parts for your car stereo. Like, I don't care as long as we've agreed on the amount. That works super well for my husband and I, because by the time we got married, we were already well-established financially. We had been managing money on our own for a while. Now, I had been managing money pretty poorly on my own. Badly, <laughs> if I recall. If anybody knows your story, we know yes. you were a financial wreck managing your money. But I was at the beginning, yes. And then, uh, you know, when we got married, we had we had a joint account, opened a joint account, and then we basically figured out how much money we needed in that bill pay account, which we've obviously adjusted over the 20 years we've been married. Yeah. Um, but what's ever quote unquote left over for fun stuff, I don't care what he spends it on. And he doesn't care what I spend mine on. Yeah. And it takes a lot of the fight out of it. For it takes sure. a lot of the tension out as well, I would imagine, because it's like everybody's got yeah. a defined amount of money. It's like, go do whatever you want to do with it. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is like the division of labor when it comes to the finances. So who is going to be in charge of what? Because it it's not healthy for one person to have all the responsibility. And or all of the control. Yeah. You know that I coach a lot of women who are coming out of divorce situations yeah, and I've too. seen a lot of financial abuse happen in relationships like that where you know typically it's the husband is handling and controlling all the money and she has no idea what's going on and she doesn't have any power there that's not healthy but I've also seen situations where 
one spouse or partner, they don't want to handle any of the money and they put all of the responsibility on the other person. And it's not really fair to the person that has to do everything. Yeah. Right. They may not necessarily want to do everything because they they almost feel like their spouse is like another child financially Mm -hmm. rather than their partner. Right. So even if one person is, quote unquote, in charge of the bills or the investments, et cetera, the other person should be informed enough to be able to pick up that task if something happens. right? Right. Because God forbid, you know, your partner get sick or, you know, is in a horrible car accident or whatever, you shouldn't be clueless about what what piece they're handling in the finances. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. So as you can imagine, because I'm the money person, I do a lot of the day-to-day stuff. Sure. However, my husband can log in. He can see everything that's going on. We have discussions more than weekly. Yeah, we just we just talk about things as they come up pretty yeah. much. Um and I was very insistent that yeah. he be involved with the financial planner and meetings with other important financial advisors in our in our circle. So yeah. um because if something happens to me, I want him to be comfortable talking to our financial advisor. Of course. Yeah, that's important that he knows what's going on, even if, you know, that's not the part that excites him. <laughs> yeah. So that that part is really important. Um, and then, of course, what are you going to use to manage all this? Are you going to use a personal finance app? That's something that I highly recommend because both of you can see what's going on in real time. I hesitate to say which one I'm using now because the one I mentioned several episodes ago has gone away. So if you want to reach out to me on social media, (laughs) I'll let you know what I'll let you know what I'm using right now. (laughs) There you go. I mean, use it to your advantage. Find one that works for you. Find one that you're comfortable with. And okay. Yeah. So, and then don't be afraid to experiment and tweak your system as needed. Now you might do something in a certain way for a certain amount of time. And, you know, maybe it works good for a while and something changes in your situation. Now you might be in a situation where your spouse retires and they have more time and you're like, would you please handle the bills for me? Like (laughs) that would be a huge help for me. That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, once you set up your system, it doesn't mean it's in stone and you, and you never change it. Of course. So the final point I want to bring up is to remember that different doesn't mean wrong. Just because your spouse or partner wants to do something differently does not mean that it's wrong. I am also talking to myself here. (laughs) (laughs) You know, your, your way works good for you because it works for your personality and your preferences doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to fit your partner. So be willing to compromise and know what is worth fighting over and what's not. Pick your fights. Yes. Pick Pick your your fights. And you know, and and it sounds really stupid when people say it, but the, 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 what, what's really there is, not everything is worth fighting over. Not everything yeah. is just worth, not everything is worth the fight. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. It's hard. It's hard. I, you know, it's, it's hard in any relationship right. uh, to, to understand that somebody doing something differently or somebody feeling differently about something doesn't make them right or wrong or you right or wrong. It's, it's sometimes difficult to remember that. Right. Well, and I think each of us have, different needs for security yeah, and needs for freedom and pleasure. So, you know, my husband has much higher security needs than I do. Mm. He wants to save more money 
And, you know, I'm like, I would be okay with our savings being here. And he's like, I'm not. And I'm (laughs) I'm like, okay, Okay. that is fine. (laughs) You know, he wants some of our savings to be in precious metals. Where I'm like, that's fine. (laughs) Wouldn't be my, would not be my first choice. Wouldn't be my first choice, but yeah. Okay. I've 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 grown to love and accept it. And it's like, okay, that's just a different container for our money. And there's nothing wrong with that. So just understanding that, you know, th- there's a reason why your partner feels that way about certain well, things. It, but you know what I'm saying that, Christine, when you say remember that there's a reason why your partner feels that way, you're giving license to the other side of that thought, which is that your partner can remember that it's okay that you are who you are and how you behave. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I wish I had come up with this saying myself and I would love to give credit to who said it first, but I don't remember either way. I'm going to say it. Blessed are the flexible for they shall not be bent out of shape. Amen. (laughs) Amen. 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 And we will end with that. So, <laughs> and that concludes today's sermon. <laughs> so, yes, money can be a source of conflict in your relationship, but it is an opportunity for increased communication, increased intimacy. It's not always going to be easy, but I promise it's going to be worth it. Fantastic. Yeah, this wasn't as bad a conversation as I thought it was going to be going into it. That was good. You made it easy. You made it interesting. Well, you know, that's always my goal. (laughs) Exactly right. Exactly right. For those who are listening who want to reach out to you, uh, get in touch with you, maybe pursue this a little further in personal conversation, how can they do that? Yeah. Well, I would love to help you in your honey, get on the same page about money. So if you want to reach out uh, and schedule a time for us to chat, you can hop over to my website, christinelucan.com forward slash apply, and we'll see if you're a good fit for coaching. And, you know, maybe you don't need that level of support. Another great option is to grab a copy of my book, Mm. Money is Emotional, Prevent Your Heart from Hijacking Your Wallet, and read it together with your spouse Ooh. or partner. Yeah. Nice so, way to kind of introduce the idea of having those conversations. Right? Absolutely. So you can find Money is Emotional uh, on Amazon and Audible. Fantastic. Well, Christine, thank you as always. Told you, I'd like every time we visit and have time together, I enjoy it. And I'm sure the listeners do as well. So I want to thank the listeners for listening. And for those who are not yet subscribers, subscribe. It's easy. You hit the subscribe button right there in front of you. Then you will never miss another episode of these podcasts. They are terrific. They're worth your time, as I'm sure you understand. On behalf of Christine, I'm Bill Tucker, wishing you a great day. And more importantly, wishing that you go out and live your great day today. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you for listening to the Money is Emotional podcast. To get in touch, visit our website at www.christinelucan.com or drop us a line at hello at christinelucan.com. And don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Christine Lucas. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing or tax advice. Always seek the advice of your advisor, tax professional, or other qualified financial professional with any questions you may have regarding your personal finances.